Hey cunts, don't forget to click the subscribe button. And she's adopted those black kids a long time ago. But they're going to say she knew that Trump was going to get elected 10 years from now. She knew that she would be uh, considered for a chief justice. And she knew so she adopted those black kids just so she could get to be chief justice. That's what from Al Sharpton. That will be his story. Trump is going to win. Uh, he's going to beat them. The Democrats will disband after this election. Disband. And then, why doesn't the Main Street media show this rally for Trump a couple of days ago? Nowhere can you find it. Nowhere. I'm not sure Biden's going to get a vote. Sleepy Joe. Sleepy Joe. But these pictures you don't see. And now, I, somebody told me, since I've been on the Joe Rogan program, uh, Spotify, I think it's called, are the, all the employees are, um, have a mutiny. They're leaving the, the company unless they censor Joe on Spotify. After they just paid him 100 million bucks to be on, the, uh, you know, to buy his uh, content. So now we're, 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 we're at the point in life where the employees of some firms dictate what management does. They're not censoring anybody else on Spotify. Why are you smoking Joe? That's why I say we're through. There's no coming back. None. And as I keep ranting and raving like an old psychopath that I am, the, um, if you live long, live long enough, you see it all. You see it all. I thought when the wall came down in 89 and all these things I've seen over my lifetime, but they pale in complexion of what's going on now. They pale in complexion. And unfortunately, when the U.S. gets a cold, everybody else, or no, when the U.S. sneezes, everybody else gets a cold. And the, uh, the rest of the world eventually follows suit. Eventually follows suit. Normally, here first, or first to follow suit, the Brits, and then everybody else. But it's just, it's remarkable how uh, censored information is. Uh, I, told, I said I, to somebody uh, the first day, Al Jazeera is, in my judgment, pretty even-keeled news. It's the Arab news that's sponsored out of Doha. It's a little biased towards the Middle East, but not, not as liberally biased as CNN and CNBC. And it's, of course, Fox is uh, certainly biased towards the right. But, um, and I watch all of them. My, the, for those of you that have been in my office, the big TV screen, plus I have a small TV screen on my desk. I watch news, not 24-7, because I'm not up 24-7. But I mean, I watch news all the time. Uh, in the, uh, and that's why I'm pretty much up to date on, on uh, the unrest issues and various other issues. It's also now why, one of the reasons why I was able, I knew when oil was going to go negative, which I predicted in March, at the, for the guys that were here before the police broke us up, and lo and behold, a few weeks later, it did go negative. Uh, and it's simple economics. There, there's, uh, for, none of you in this room have ever been to Cushing, Oklahoma, where they, they deliver barrels for the uh, uh, CBOE, Chicago Board of uh, uh, Trade or Options or whatever. And um, when you have 13 million, approximately 13 million barrels excess a day supply vis-a-vis -vis demand, it's math 101. And when you know that the Russians aren't going to probably hold to the contracts, and when you know the Iranians and some of the other countries like Venezuela are pumping as much as they can, uh, as long as they can. Um, and uh, when you know that the um, OPEC is really a toothless organization now. OPEC is the governing body, supposedly, for the major oil producers. Uh, and when you know um, that uh, almost 90% of the money in the world is managed, run by kids less than 30 years old. And you know all that. And you know they haven't seen. And you know there's snowflakes. 
there is a high probability that, you know, all was going to go to zero or even negative, and it did. And it did. And right now, in my opinion, we're having a, a, a dead cat bounce in the price of oil. And it went back up to about 45 or something like that. And it's, and it's back in the mid-30s, maybe high 30s now. But the kids, the, the other gurus, the financial gurus, don't know that. One, because they haven't lived it. I've, been, I've lived through seven recessions. Seven. And uh, if you go back and look, read the headlines of the Financial Times or you read the headlines of the Wall Street Journal from 10 or 20 years ago, they always say, worst, worst recession in memory. Because the guy that's writing the article is only 28 years old, so <laughs> he doesn't have much of a memory because he hasn't been around long enough. Those articles are rarely, rarely ever written by, you know, somebody 55, 60 or older that remembers, that remembers. Um, but um, I want to know how they're going to rip this gal apart. I mean, I know Trump knew she had black kids. I mean, give me a break. But... Um, I mean, they must be throwing up the libs. They must be just fucking, jer I mean, jumping off fucking staircases with a rope around their neck. Because it's hard for them to, to jump on this, cat, this gal. Plus, she's got an exemplary record teaching, an exemplary record in vote, I mean, voting conservatively um, in the lower courts. And uh, she was adopting black kids before it was fashionable. Now, if you're... Uh, Angelina Jolie or Madonna, I mean, you got you gots to have one or two black kids, a, a China person, and uh, you got to, I mean, you want to show how, how even-handed and liberal you are. Uh, but it's, it's interesting times. And uh, the, um, um, in the second wave, um, the, uh, there was a, uh, I don't know if I told this group, but uh, not last night, but the night before last, in Oxford, Oxford Circus, it was a big party. They, uh, wouldn't go, they wouldn't close the bars down. Tens of thousands of people fighting with the police in London. So, I mean, we may have waves until I'm dead. Corona waves. The fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the eighth. And when I said, because of my 50-year experience of managing people, both under one roof, which is, which my, is my preference, and virtually, there was no way humanly possible the homo sapien could adhere to the rules to try to save people, old people like myself, from the corona because, one, they don't give a shit. Two, you know, I heard young kids in a restaurant say, well, he's had a good run. He's 70 years old. Let him die. I actually heard that. I wanted to get, jump up and choke him. The, uh, but I knew that it wasn't possible. Just like... I know you're not going to follow the steps. That's how come I'm sorry to say I know. I've been doing this 27 years. And I've had people smarter and dumber than you. Because you can't shake the DNA. You just can't do it. As much as you want. Why do 60% of the people that smoke have lung cancer, smoke again? It's like being Irish. They can't help it. They can't help but step on their dick. Why are the Irish innately in their DNA drunks? They can't help it. They've got centuries of it. Yeah, but as the Irishman in the, in the back of the room just said, but we still love food. And there's no question about it. Uh, Sally and I would be first to say, if you can't have fun in Ireland, something right with you. I mean, something's just not right with you. It's probably because you don't drink. And I'm not saying everybody has to drink, but there was a time when I first got in the oil business in the late 70s uh, in Texas, if you didn't drink, you didn't do deals. They, weren't in, they didn't give a fuck if you had an alcohol problem. If you didn't drink, to excess, I heard a, a jillion times, you can't trust that boy. And they don't mean boy in a derogatory way, like, you know, like they call uh, blacks in the South. 
I, I, I don't trust that boy. He don't drink. And a man that don't fucking drink, I can't do a deal with. Well, I had no problem in that regard. I, I was right up at the top. You know, man, I could drink with the best of them. But um, now you can't hardly find anybody that does drink. You can't find out anybody that does drink. The, um, but there, you know, and I say this, I can't hardly say it with a straight face. Uh, you know, drinking in moderation is okay, but drinking to excess is better. Drinking to excess is better. Um, last night, you saw the, uh, uh, the preeminent asshole of all time, uh, my virtual mentor, who I copied this program from. Uh, and I've, I've added the best of best practices that didn't exist when he was around. Uh, and coincidentally, he's just from down the road here. Uh, and coincidentally, I spent my, not coincidentally, I spent my 75th birthday at his home, Skibo Castle, uh, uh, as, as uh, part of the gifts that uh, my lovely wife gave me for my birthday. And the, um, uh, and the history they have at Skibo of Mr. Carnegie is, Slightly different than the history that I know, but um, that's, that's all right. And uh, for those of you that saw the um, picture on, uh, on my social media, to the extent I have limited social media, it had three pictures of Skibo Castle, and then it had three pictures of Guthrie here. And uh, guess what? There's a reasonable facsimile, and that's not a coincidence, because that was in my mind or my dreams and my goals from years ago. From years ago, and at one time, shortly after I purchased this estate, I looked at purchasing Skibo, and ultimately uh, Peter DeSavery did, the uh, property developer. Um, but I saw all I saw because I'd already been I spent a lot of money renovating this place, and and Skibo is about uh, three times bigger than this place, and all I saw was pound signs, dollar signs that would just I would I would spend like shit through a goose, so I didn't do it. Uh, and I didn't do it. What are uh, some of the <clears throat> words that describe uh, Mr. Carnegie uh, or your takeaways about Mr. Carnegie? So in his, his early year, he got a mentor, uh, Mr. Scott, when they were working on the railroad, and he took action to solve the problem instead of waiting for Mr. Scott's permission when the, one of the court crashed. Well, all, not all, but almost all these guys take action. And when you take action, what you're saying is you're not afraid of the consequences. And virtually every man, woman, or it that has been through the seminar is afraid of the consequences. Yes, sir. He knew when to say no, especially to his mentor, Thomas Scott. The guy that helped him get started. And that is so true. No good deed goes unpunished. Yes, sir. He made offers that people couldn't refuse. Just like in the, in the Godfather. At which QLA is the mafia model without a gun. Because we make offers <clears throat> so lucrative in their eyes, solving their, their problems, and again, for the goody twos that want to help everybody and that kind of shit. Well, we are helping them because we are their exit. And in some cases, we're their only possibility of an exit. And if that's what you've got to ring in your brain to, to make you do this, fine. But it, it, it's, it, it's, it's not the truth. If it makes you feel better, fine. We all do things that make us feel better that we know down deep inside aren't copacetic with the world. I don't have to do that. I don't, I don't, I don't need that uh, extra, as they say in Texas. I don't need that extra, in, and instead of saying incentive, they say incentive. I don't need that extra, you know, because I'm doing it almost always for selfish reasons. And the selfish reasons have overflow, they have consequences, i.e. other people are helped. That's great. But when I started, I wasn't interested in the other people, and I'm still not interested in the other people. The only people I'm interested in is my flock. 
uh, the QLA bots, as we now call it. Um, what else about, uh, yes, sir? So he had a scar since his childhood, basically, because of his mother and how they, uh, their situation got uh, bad and the way they immigrated. And this hunger made him basically go there and achieve And she big wanted things. to go back to her little town and ride in a carriage down the main street so they could all tell that uh, her family had made it, even though they left, left in, uh, I don't know about disgrace, but they certainly left in poverty. They certainly left in poverty. And, the, uh, and Mr. Carnegie, to the best of my knowledge, uh, not the best, he had no formal education, and he, he was always working, but he, attra he was attracted himself to high-performance people, not dissimilar to myself. I sought out uh, the Hunt brothers. I sought out um, the uh, Onassis people. Uh, I didn't know that it was, of course, the Grazos was the CEO at the time. But, uh, and so when, as first I saw him, I knew that I wanted to uh, know him. And in those days, they didn't have security in buildings. In Olympic Tower, um, uh, uh, downtown uh, New York, mid Manhattan, about 55th Street, more or less. Um, and we were in a meeting, and he comes staggering, not staggering drunk, but he shuffled because he was already old. He shuffled, whatever that disease is when you can't lift your feet up too well and you shuffle. He shuffled in, and he went around uh, to the various meetings in a, in a room about this big. It had six or seven uh, tables. They had six or seven separate meetings going. And he shuffled around and stopped at one table and said, didn't work in 38 or 52, won't work now. Didn't work in 67 or uh, uh, 73, it won't work now. And that's all he'd say, and he'd, and he'd shuffle out. And so I was at one of those tables, and I said, who's he? And he says, he's uh, uh, Grazos, Mr. Grazos, and uh, he was the right-hand man for Aristotle and Nassus for 60 plus years. Um, and uh, he didn't explain. He never explained anything, ever. And what do you want? You want explanation. The big guys never explain. If you don't get it, that's it's tough shit. If you don't get it, it's tough shit. But I'm going to explain the secret sauce when we get off the film for the tenth time. But I mean, he was—he was a great example of. Um, I never saw him. Oh, so I went and found—I went floor by floor in the building until I found there was an open door, and I could see through the open door a really pretty secretary, and I could see beyond her door. And this is when everybody had offices, as opposed to what they do now. And I could see through the door a little old guy sitting behind a desk. When he, and and uh, he saw me, and he goes, and so I got by, by the secretary, and I went in his office, and there was a banana, a pear, and an apple on a plate. And I looked at it, I looked at him, I looked at it again. Um, Has anybody offered you lunch yet, sir? And he laughed, and he pointed at the plate. And I go, uh, I agree. He, he was saying it with his face. I was supposed to eat that shit. And I said, can I buy you lunch? He stood up real quick, and that, uh, the relationship was at its inception. And he was very kind to me for many, many years. And then I got an office, just as I had an office in uh, 30 Rock in the penthouse, uh, because of my first chairman of Great Western, Mr. Anderson, uh, he gave me uh, Christine Onassis office to use because it was always empty. That was the daughter of Aristotle Onassis. And it overlooked Fifth Avenue and St. Patrick's Cathedral. And this is on YouTube. And I used to sit there at the desk, and it was on a, on a, a corner with my feet on the desk, and the phone had uh, buttons, the White House, the Vatican, blah, blah, blah. And so I used to press them, and when they'd answer the phone, oh, I'd hang up, you know. Um, and so that's what the office I used uh, for several years. Um, but I, w I went after, and I've met those people. Now it's a little more difficult because of, um, forget corona, but it's a little more difficult because of uh, security in buildings, and you, you can't wander around. Uh, although I, some of you kids have heard that story, and so they go wander around, and they get in trouble because the secure bu building security drags them out. And... Uh, 
they're not interested in the fact that uh, I read in your, your first hundred million and uh, well, you know, so but the uh, what else about uh, Mr. Uh, Carnegie? Yes, sir. He brought competition amongst his uh, employees to increase production. Competition that he rewarded financially. Patting the guy on the head or the guy on the head. You can't do, you can't pat people on the head anymore. That's considered, I don't know what it's considered. Maybe he's sexist, I guess. I can understand why you can't slap the girls in the ass anymore. But I don't understand why you can't just give them a pat on the head. But you can't do that either. Can't touch them, basically. And there's been some rulings in court. Some of you people probably are more aware than I am about invading space. Now, when I first read those headlines, I thought they were talking about aliens. I had no idea that we had personal space. Now, in the hood, you get in somebody's face, you're going to fight. Okay? That I understood. But invading space, I said, God damn, well, somebody actually documented a, an alien thing. And then I, of course, read it and realized that it wasn't anything like that. Um, what else about uh, Mr. Carnegie? Yes, sir, in the back. He resented being poor with a passion, but he did something about it. Boy, I know that feeling. I've been poor. You heard me say it before. And um, for those of people that have been really poor and even gotten their head above water and to survive and then make a few bucks, that's, they understand that feeling. But to not just make a few bucks, but get stinking rich from the lower ebbs of life, it's a feeling you can't write a book about, you can't describe, blah, 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 blah. My mother understood it, and she only lived vicariously through me, but she swam. She really walked. Her mother carried her across the Rio Grande River uh, the, in 1924 when she was about three or something like that. Uh, but when you have come from that to when she actually died here, which a lot of people know, that's a quantum fucking leap. So uh, she lived vicariously through me, and I, I was happy to have her live vicariously through me. As do some of your parents now, unfortunately, live vicariously through you, and if they're living vicariously through you, they don't have very high standards. Now, you may be in a better p posture or position in life than your parents, and I believe almost all parents, not all parents, but almost all parents want a better life for their kid. You've heard that a jillion times, right? Almost all parents don't want their kids to make the stu same stupid fucking mistakes that they made. At all. all. We've had kids in here where their parents didn't want them to do better than they did. But um, very few parents understand the success leaves clues and, you know, how am I going to get you to pattern some high-performance person? And again, that's why the uh, poverty, um, circle of poverty is so hard to break and why poverty goes back uh, many, many generations. And again, Mr. Carnegie uh, was uh, a hungry little guy. The operative word is little. So if they say he was five foot one, you, we all know he wasn't. You know, it's like Schwarzenegger's not six foot four. I mean... Um, and um, he had uh, a hunger, not dissimilar to my own hunger for success, for a slightly different reason. Uh, Mr. Carnegie was a mama's boy. You know, he, you know, he really, uh, his whole world revolved around his mother. Uh, and so he wanted to make his mother proud. He didn't necessarily, I think, want to make his father proud, but he certainly wanted to make his mother proud. And the system has similarities to all the icons that you've seen each night. And uh, the last icon that you uh, saw was the one that was the basis of this program. Um, and, but he's been doing it a long, long time. Uh, and when he sold out to J.P. Morgan for $450 million or something like that, um, is it a coincidence that I created from zero to $450 million? Allah speaks in mysterious ways, you know. Is it a coincidence that I spent my 75th birthday there? Is it a coincidence that I'm just, you know, 30 or 35 miles up the road from where he was born? When you go into that little town, uh, not every street in every building, but a lot of streets and a lot of buildings have Carnegie in it because he gifted a lot of stuff. And he uh, attempted, uh, till the day he died, uh, to be giving his money away, 
And he said that if you, uh, if you, if you, if you, you allow your children not to be born into poverty, you're making a big error. Now, and I've said it many times on YouTube, uh, our kids say they're okay with it, that they're not getting any money from us. They're not going to get a dime. Um, and uh, though they say they're cool with it, my intuition tells me they're not although they would never tell me that. They might tell Sally, but they haven't told Sally. They say they're cool with it. They're not, 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 not going to get hundreds of millions or anything. They're going to get not 25 cents. What else about Mr. Carnegie? Yes, sir. It's interesting to see when uh, at uh, different points in his life, there was this inner battle and was inside him or conflict between he wants to be like nice and kind to people or we want to stop pursuing wealth and then he kind of goes goes back at it and then push harder because he realized and and if you know as much about mr carnegie as i do he realized that that didn't work being nice doesn't work if being nice work kids look at you how has that program worked out for you? It hasn't. I mean, you can have 2.4 kids and a house and a picket fence and 1.6 dogs and uh, be married uh, 27 years and have uh, 3.2 grandchildren. Blah, blah. That's for the, you know, the, the, for, the, uh, for the millions of people. But categorically to a man or a woman, the, uh, the, the uh, nice formula doesn't work. It doesn't, because people take advantage of you. And as I said earlier, when I got up here this morning, no good, tea, no good deed goes unpunished. And so then you just have a, a circle of, uh, you know, uh, not underperformers. But see, I believe that we were put on this earth, however we got here, to be all we can be not a fraction thereof. And being nice, a good person, going to the clergy. That's cool. They get paid a little to be nice and to tell everybody it's okay. We all know it's not okay. We know it's not okay to have, you know, starving kids in Africa and all these places, you know, where they don't have enough water, blah, blah, blah. Um, is there enough money on the earth to do away with poverty across the board? Probably. And let's say we did it in 2020. By 2030, we'd be right fucking back to exactly where we are. And that's one, in my judgment, that's one of the reasons that all the guys, you know, 85% uh, of all the money in the planet is owned by, I don't know, 500 people. They could do, you know, do away with poverty, you'd have to implement it and execute it, you know, in five years. But then, human nature, just like I knew social distancing wouldn't work, they know human nature is part of the group is going to steal it from the other, and we're going to be right back where we were. And that's why it's tough uh, when the billionaire, billionaires made their, uh, there's a, they joined that thing, I forget who started it up, 10 years ago, where they were going to um, uh, donate money before they die, all their money. And the way Warren Buffett responded, which is probably how I would respond, is he gave 30 or $40 billion to the Bill Gates Foundation. And he says, you know, you guys are in the business of managing money for poverty. You do it. And my judgment was, he was really saying, fuck, I don't have time for that shit. Here's $30 billion. Uh, you, you fuck with it. And I, you know, I'll go on and continue to, to run Berkshire Hathaway. Um, because being a goody two shoes, and I've, you know, I've been there, can be a thankless job. It's like raising kids. Psychiatrists, child psychiatrists will tell you you have three kids, you've got one in three chance of one of the kids making it to be successful. You've got one in three chances for the kid, one kid to be a fucking bum, and you've got one in three chances for one kid to be normal. Those aren't, those aren't, odds aren't very good, are they? One in three. 
And which one of the one and three are you? For those of you that came from three kids, which one are you? I'm one of mine. Well, you know, were you the youngest? Second. Well, then, see, your dad already ran out of gunpowder by that time. So you got the low end. The low end. We've had uh, Josh Kim is one of 10. I'm one of 15. 15? 16. 16. Well, youngest or oldest? Number 13. Well, your dad ran out of shit a long time ago. I mean, he had no lead in his pencil. It, that was just a perfunctory fuck that, 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 that born you. And there's a whole study that's been done, this is a long time ago, where the older the, the, the father is, the less potent the sperm. It can still impregnate. But, and so by the time it got to you, and you. Now, I don't know who the oldest, in the, if the oldest is the brightest and the most successful. I don't know that. But I know that it's been a, a, a medical fact that the sperm diminishes over time. And by the time you're 70, 75, I mean there is virtually nothing left. Um, the, um, whereas you can still go through the motions. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, I, I, I've been cut up a long time ago, so I can't procreate anymore. But if I did, I mean, he may come out a cyclops or some shit, you know, uh, something wrong with him, like he had been taking thalidomide or something. Uh, anything else um, uh, with Mr. Carnegie? Now, you now know, and I give credit to Mr. Carnegie, what I do. And the guys that copy me and cheat off me don't give credit to me or Carnegie. But that's where it comes from. Arguably the most successful businessman in the history of the planet. Arguably his net worth would be in the hundred, many hundreds of billions in today's dollars compared to dollars back then. And that's what you're, that's what you're learning. Um, and it was as simple then, now I should say, as it was then. Okay, you two, goodbye. <laughs>